Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Omende and I'm going to take you through a lecture series on the triangles of the neck, and so basically the anatomy of the neck, okay? So um, you need to know what landmarks are there on the neck. So this is the skeletal um, structure of the neck. So you need to be able to identify the hyoid bone, okay? Then the thyroid cartilage there, the cricoid cartilage, and the carotid tubercle, which is usually the transverse processes of the sixth um, cervical uh, vertebra. So those are the uh, um, uh, osteocartilaginous um, landmarks of the neck. Now, again, when you're to look at the surface anatomy of the neck, the two heads of sternocleidomastoid are visible, the sternal head and the clavicular head of the sternocleidomastoid. Then you have the suprasternal fossa, that's the fossa above the, the manubrium of the sternum. Then you have the greater supraclavicular fossa, the fossa above the clavicle, and those are the um, structures you're able to appreciate. So the sternal and the clavicular head of the sternocleidomastoid muscle there, the suprasternal fossa. And in male, the uh, thyroid cartilage is usually very um, prominent anteriorly at the midline. So when you look at the side of the neck, it sort of gives you a quadrilateral or rather a four-sided um, area. Okay, so you have superiorly, posteriorly, inferiorly, and anteriorly. So when you look at the side of the neck, you need to be able to define the boundaries of this quadrilateral space. So anteriorly, you have the midline, the anterior median line that passes at the center of the neck. So the midline of the neck anteriorly, that forms the anterior border of our quadrilateral space. Posteriorly, you have the anterior border of trapezius muscle. So this number six here is trapezius. So the anterior border of trapezius gives us the posterior boundary of the quadrilateral space. Superiorly, you have the base of the mandible and a line joining the angle of the mandible to the mastoid process. Then you continue posteriorly to the superior nuchal line, and that gives you the superior margin of a quadrilateral space. So you have um, the base of the mandible, angle of mandible, with a line joining it to the mastoid process, then you continue to the superior nuchal line. So that gives you the superior boundary of the quadrilateral space. And inferiorly, we have the clavicle. So our quadrilateral space inferiorly is the clavicle, anteriorly is the anterior median line, Posteriorly is the anterior margin of the trapezium muscle, and superiorly you have the base of the mandible, the angle of the mandible, with the line joining it to the mastoid and the superior nuchal line. So this quadrangular space is divided into two, anterior part and posterior part by sternocleidomastoid. So that gives you anything anterior to the sternocleidomastoid, this is your anterior triangle of the neck. And anything posterior to the sternocleidomastoid, this is the posterior triangle of the neck. I hope that is clear. You need to be able to define the quadrilateral space and divide it into anterior triangle, anterior to the sternocleidomastoid, and posterior triangle, posterior to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Again, this is the quadrilateral outline, anterior median line anteriorly, clavicle inferiorly, anterior border of trapezius posteriorly, then superiorly is from the base of the mandible then a line joining the angle to the mastoid process to the superior nuchal line. And then we said the quadrilateral space is divided by sternocleidomastoid into anterior triangle and posterior to sternocleidomastoid is your posterior triangle. Now, what do you notice here? This anterior triangle, anterior to sternocleidomastoid, is divided into parts. So you have the homohyoid muscle that comes from the hyoid bone and comes downwards, so it has two bellies. Okay, so this homohyoid divides the anterior triangle. So we have the carotid part and muscular part. That's below the hyoid bone. But the portion of the anterior triangle above the hyoid bone is again divided into submental part and the digastric triangle. Digastric triangle is between the anterior and posterior belly of digastric muscle, anterior, posterior belly. So that's the digastric or submandibular triangle. Then 
between the midline and the anterior digastric there, that's your submental triangle. Then the remaining part of the anterior triangle below the hyoid bone is divided into two triangles, the muscular triangle anteriorly and the carotid triangle by the side. When you come to the posterior triangle, part of the quadrilateral space posterior to the sternocleidal mastoid is divided into two by the inferior belly of homohyoid. So it will divide into the subclavian triangle inferiorly and occipital triangle superiorly. So sternocleidal mastoid neck, therefore becomes a very important landmark in the neck. So you can be asked to write about this muscle, so you need to know about it because it's a very important landmark. So it has two origins, a sternal head from the manubrium of the sternum and a clavicular head from the superior part of the medial third of the clavicle. Where does sternocleidal mastoid insert? Sterno, sternum, cleido, clavicle. So those, that's the origin, mastoid insertion. So it inserts onto the mastoid process and the lateral half of the superior nuchal line. It inserts on the mastoid process and the lateral half of the superior nuchal line. So it has two origins and two insertions. What's the nerve supply of the sternocleidal mastoid? The spinal part of the accessory nerve. So spinal accessory nerve innervates the sternocleidal mastoid muscle and it's supplied by superior thyroid artery, suprascapular artery, and occipital artery. Superior thyroid, suprascapular, and occipital. Superior thyroid and occipital arteries are from external carotid artery, while suprascapular artery comes from um, the subclavian artery. So, sternocleidomastoid, what are the actions? If one sternocleidomastoid on one side acts, it will tilt the head to the same side. So, if the right sternocleidomastoid is acting, it will tilt the head to the right side. Tilt. Then, if both of them contract right and left, you tend to extend the neck at the atlanto-occipital joint. Sort of extend your neck is to turn your head backwards as if you're looking up. Okay? So, when you extend the neck at atlanto-occipital joint, both right and left sternocleidomastoid um, contract. Then, again, when both of them act, you tend to flex the vertebra to make your chin to approach the manubrium. Okay? of the sternum so that's it about the division of the neck into different triangles now when you to look at the anatomy of the neck you have skin superficially followed by superficial fascia then the deep fascia which you call the fascia coli fascia of the neck is called fascia coli and from the deep fascia now you get to the deep structures so you should be able to divide these deep structures as Structures that lie above the hyoid bone, you describe them, and structures that lie below the hyoid bone, you later on discuss them. So the skin of the neck is loosely attached anteriorly, okay? But posteriorly, the skin is thick and is adherent to the underlying structures. Usually the skin has numerous sebaceous glands in this region and it's well vascularized. And if you look at the neck very well, the skin of the neck, you are able to see transverse lines and that is very important especially surgically when you want to make an incision you have to follow the transverse lines okay so what's the nerve supply to the skin of the neck it gets its um, innervation from c2 c3 c4 those are cervical nerves from the spinal cord the anterolateral part gets anterior rami supply through anterior cutaneous great auricular, lesser occipital, and supraclavicular nerves, while posterior part gets dorsal, posterior, primary rami. So that's the innervation of the skin. Remember, you have greater auricular, lesser occipital, supraclavicular nerves, and posteriorly, you also have the posterior rami contributing. Then from the skin, we go to superficial fascia. The superficial fascia of the neck the main content is the platysma muscle. Platysma is a very superficial muscle that runs from the pectoral and deltoid region and runs superficially upwards to go and insert onto the base of the mandible. So, apart from platysma, we also have superficial veins such as anterior jugular vein and external jugular veins. Then we have cutaneous nerves in the superficial fascia of the neck such as less, lesser occipital, greater auricular, transverse nerve of the neck, or transverse cervical nerve and the supraclavicular nerve. So these are the four cutaneous nerves in the superficial fascia of the neck. Remember, the cervical branch of facial nerve is also found here because it's coming to 
innervate the platysma. Where does this cervical? Remember facial nerve within the substance of the parotid it divides into two. There is upper temporal followed by zygomatic, buccal, then mandibular, and lastly cervical. So cervical usually goes downwards to supply platysma, which is a muscle of facial expression. Remember, it, a platysma causes you to bring the angles of the mouth downwards. Okay. So these are the layers from the skin. There is superficial fascia or some fat. Then there's platysma muscle within the superficial aspect, plus the neurovascular structures before you get to the deep fascia of the neck, which we shall discuss. So platysma, I've said, is a subcutaneous muscle and it's wide, usually very, um, not very fleshy, so it's very thin and it runs upwards and medially upwards and medially. It originates from deltoid and pectoral fascia, goes upwards and medially, and then starts onto the base of the mandible. And it's innervated by the cervical branch of facial nerve. Remember, what's the action? It's a muscle of facial expression. So it draws the corners of the mouth inferiorly, as if you're expressing sadness and fright, and it can be able to draw the skin of the neck superiorly. When you sort of clench your teeth, you feel the skin of your neck uh, moving superiorly and that's because the platysma muscle is contracted then we go to the deep fascia of the neck which is fascia cola it's divided into six investing fascia pretracheal prevertebral the carotid sheath buccopharyngeal fascia and pharyngobacillar fascia so you can be asked to describe the deep fascia of the of the neck as an ec so you need to be able to understand this so the deep fascia of the neck, which is fascia coli, as you can see, the green there is the investing fascia. Okay, so look at the green as we are highlighting here. Okay, just observe here. That's your investing fascia, and observe it here. That's your investing fascia, the highlighted green part. So it's very obvious that this investing fascia is coming to enclose trapezius muscle and enclosing the sternocleidomastoid muscle. So the deep fascia, the most superficial portion of it is the investing fascia. It encloses trapezius muscle, sternocleidomastoid, and posterior belly of digastric, and also encloses parotid and submandibular glands. So you need to know all this, okay? Deep investing fascia encloses three muscles, trapezius, sternocleidomastoid, and posterior belly of digastric, and also encloses the parotid and submandibular glands. It's usually attached to bony landmarks of the upper and lower boundaries of the neck and the zygomatic arc of the face. So after that, we go to the pretracheal layer, pretracheal. So in front of the trachea, it lies deep to the muscles below the hyoid, deep to the infrahyoid muscles, and it usually encloses the pharynx, as it continues as esophagus and closes the larynx and its continuation, the trachea, it also encloses the thyroid and parathyroid gland. So don't confuse the structures enclosed by investing fascia and those enclosed by pretracheal fascia. So pharynx, larynx, trachea, esophagus, thyroid, and parathyroid glands. Then this pretracheal layer usually forms the thyroid sheath. The thyroid sheath helps you to bind the thyroid gland to the larynx, therefore, it forms the suspensory ligament of the thyroid gland. Pretracheal layer forms suspensory ligament of thyroid that links the thyroid onto the larynx. And it extends from the arc of the cricoid cartilage, the thyroid cartilage, hyoid bone, and down to the fibrous pericardium and superior mediastinum. So this is very important to know that from the neck, pretracheal fascia gets to the mediastinum and connects also with the fibrous pericardium of the heart. So then we go to the prevertebral layer, this is what encloses the cervical vertebra and the prevertebral muscle. So it will extend from the base of the skull to the superior mediastinum. From the base of the skull to the superior mediastinum. Base of skull to the thorax, superior mediastinum. And it's continuous with anterior longitudinal ligament and endothoracic fascia. This prevertebral layer covers the subclavian vessels and the roots of the brachial plexus. So you need to be able to know all these points because when they ask you to describe it, you need to mention all these points. Okay? Then. It extends into the upper limb as axillary sheath. So sub encloses subclavian vessels, root of brachial plexus, and forms the axillary sheath. And it's from basal skull to the superior mediastinum. Then you have the carotid sheath on the lateral aspect, enclosing the common carotid artery that divides into internal and external carotid, 
then it also contains internal jugular vein and vagus nerve. So those are the 